Hi, my name is Daniel Wicks, and I'm going to tell you about a new candidate construction of indistinguishable obfuscation via oblivious LW sampling. This is joint work with Hoptech We. Let me start by giving you our results in a nutshell. We give a new candidate construction of indistinguishable obfuscation, or IO. Our construction relies on learning with error style techniques, um, uh, but we are unable to show security under the LW assumption on its own. Instead, we formulate a new simple indistinguishable based assumption that has a circular security flavor, and we show security under this new assumption. The overall construction is plausibly post-quantum secure and conceptually simple. Uh, it relies on a new primitive that we call oblivious LW sampling, and we show that oblivious LW sampling implies IO under standard assumption, just regular LWE, but then uh, we construct oblivious LW sampling uh, uh, using our new uh, assumption. So let me start by telling you what IO is. Uh, it gives you a way of taking a program P and obfuscating it to derive a program P tilde, which is functional equivalent to P. So on every input X, P of X and P tilde of X give you the exact same output. But the uh, obfuscated program P tilde should hide all of the internal implementation details of the original program P. And the way this is formalized is that if you take two functional equivalent programs, P1 and P2, and you obfuscate them, then you cannot distinguish which one of the programs uh, you started with. The obfuscation of P1 is computationally indistinguishable from the obfuscation of P2. A long series of works have shown that if you have IO, you can use it to construct a large number of really magical cryptographic primitives that we don't know how to construct in any other way. Things like non-interactive key agreement, functional encryption, succinct garbled RAM, and so on and so forth. So the big question is, how do we construct IO? And let me give you a brief history of prior constructions. So the initial constructions of IO rely on something called multilinear maps. And the good news about these constructions is that they're plausibly post-quantum secure. Moreover, these constructions have received a lot of cryptoanalysis. Some of them were broken, but the ones that survived have received a lot of attention. And the hope is that if they haven't been broken yet, then they may or they're likely to be actually secure. But unfortunately, these constructions don't have any kind of a proof of security or reduction from any nice or falsifiable assumption Instead, we just have a construction, uh, candidate construction of obfuscation. The assumption is that the construction is secure. A more recent series of works uh, constructs IO using functional encryption. And uh, the series culminated in a really beautiful uh, recent work of Jane, Lynn, and Sahai from last year, which showed how to construct IO from a number of well studied assumptions, namely learning parity with noise. SXDH assumption, that's an assumption of bilinear maps, the uh, learning without errors or LW assumption, and pseudorandom generators in NC0. So this is a really celebrated result. Uh, but on the downside, it's clear that this construction is not post-quantum secure because it relies on bilinear maps. And moreover, the construction is complicated and relies on this combination of many different uh, assumptions working in tandem. There are a few other miscellaneous approaches, uh, for example, tensor product construction, a construction based on affine determinant programs. And very recently, uh, construction by Brakersky et al. Uh, using a framework that they call split FHE or split fully homomorphic encryption, which uh, they implemented relying on an interplay between the LWE and decision composite residuosity assumption. So this last work was really the main inspiration and starting point for our result. And here we give a new construction of IO uh, that relies on an intermediate primitive we call functional encodings, which is really a small variant of the split FHE primitive in the work of Brakersky et al. And it's relatively easy to show once you have functional encodings, you can use those to construct XIO, that stands for exponential efficient IO, which you can then leverage to build uh, the full notion of IO. And uh, all of these are provably secure under standard LWE. So the hard part is then how to instantiate functional encodings. And we give a new way to do this using LWE style crypto systems. In more detail, we actually start with a fully homomorphic encryption scheme 
uh, that we call the dual gentrified waters or dual GSW FHE. It's a small variant of the GSW FHE. And we combine it with a new primitive that we call oblivious LW sampling to get functional encodings. So we show a theorem. Uh, uh, so oblivious LW sampling is a new primitive that we define and we, abstra we abstract it out as a standalone primitive that has its own definition. And we give a theorem that if you have this no primitive of oblivious LW sampling, that uh, then together with the LW assumption that lets you provably build functional encryption and XIO and IO. So the only part where we need some new non-standard assumptions is in the construction of oblivious LW sampling itself. Uh, we give a new construction of this object under a non-standard version of uh, uh, non-standard assumptions. But one thing I want to point out is that this gives a new approach of constructing IO from a generic primitive, oblivious LW sampling, where the generic primitive does not involve uh, general computation. This should be seen in contrast to other generic ways of getting IO from primitives like functional encryption, which do require, do involve some general notion of computation. Okay, so let me tell you what functional encodings are, and I'll tell you how to construct them. So in a functional encoding scheme, we have a secret value X, uh, and you should think of this as a relatively small value, L bits. And we want to hide this value X, but we want to reveal uh, so the outputs of several functions on this value X. So we want to reveal the outputs of F1 of X up to FQ of X, where these functions FI are public functions. Everyone knows them. And you should think, uh, so one way to do this would be to just write down the outputs of all of these functions. But we want to do this using much smaller, a much smaller description, much smaller way of revealing the outputs than just writing down all of these outputs. So here we should think of each function output as being m bits, where m is relatively large, and also the number, the total number of function outputs that we're giving out is large. So the way we're going to do this, or the way function encodings do this, is by encoding the value x into some uh, encoding e. And for each function fi, we're also going to give an opening of the function uh, fi. This opening depends on the randomness of the encoding, the input x, or it depends on everything, really, and the function fi itself. The only uh, thing that makes this non-trivial, why we don't just give out fi of x as the opening, is that we want the size of each of these openings to be small, much, uh, much less than m bits, m to the 1 minus epsilon bits for some epsilon greater than 0. Now, if you have the encoding and you have all of these openings, then you can use them to decode each of the function outputs. And what this gives you is uh, by combining the encoding and all of the openings, we have a short description of all of these function outputs f1 of x up to fq of x. At least as long as q is large, then in an amortized sense, the total size of the encoding and all of the openings is much smaller than the total size of all of the function outputs. Okay, for security, we consider an adversary that sees the encoding and each of the Q openings. And we want to say that the adversary does not learn the hidden value X. We can define two types of security. Indistinguishable based security says that as long as uh, 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 we have two values X and X prime for, for which all of the functions output the same have the same output, then uh, you cannot distinguish uh, uh, x from x prime, given the values that the adversary sees. And then we have a simulation-based notion of security that says that we can actually simulate everything the adversary sees, just given the function outputs. And this will be actually the notion that we'll focus on in this work, simulation-based security. It's fairly easy to see that simulation-based security requires a CRS, and we're going to consider this notion in the CRS or common reference string model where the CRS can be uh, arbitrarily long. We don't care about the length of the CRS. It's also relatively easy to see that once you have functional encodings, they give you uh, XIO, where XIO uh, stands for exponential efficient IO, but you can just think of it as IO for circuits with a polynomial domain. In other words, the inputs are numbers, values between one and N, where capital N is some large polynomial. And uh, the reason for this is actually easy to see. It's really the same promise function codings. We want to hide the circuit C 
while revealing the output of the circuit on all of the n inputs, c1 up to cn. So that's exactly the same problem as before, just instead of x, we have the circuit c, and instead of f of x, we have c of 1 up to c of n. And so uh, it's uh, easy to see that if you have functional encodings, then it directly gives you uh, xio. Okay, so uh, the goal now is to build functional encodings via the, uh, uh, to, to construct by functional encodings. And we do so uh, by relying on something called the dual GSW fully homomorphic encryption scheme, uh, which will then combine with oblivious LW sampling. But first I wanna show you that actually just with this dual GSW scheme, you almost get something that looks like a function encoding, uh, except it's missing a crucial security property. So let me tell you what dual GSW is. In fact, I'm not gonna tell you uh, the scheme itself. I'll just tell you some nice properties that the scheme has. You can see our paper for the scheme itself. So in dual GSW, uh, uh, you can think of it as a fully homomorphic encryption scheme where there's a public key, which is a LW matrix A, uh, a, a tall, thin matrix, M by N matrix, where M is much bigger than N. And there's a way to encrypt an input X under this public key and derive some uh, ciphertext C. And you can actually show that this uh, encryption is semantically secure. The ciphertext C hides X under the LW assumption. Moreover, there's a homomorphic computation you can uh, uh, perform on the ciphertext C to evaluate some function F. And you get a new ciphertext C sub F. And this new ciphertext uh, has the following structure. So this is the main property of this encryption. The value of ciphertext C sub F is just an LW sample A times some uh, secret RF plus some small error E sub F. So this is an LW sample plus the output of the function F of X times Q over two. So here the output of the function is M bits where M is also the height of this matrix A. And lastly, there's also a way to, uh, if you have the function f, the input x, and the randomness r that was used to encrypt it, then you can also uh, figure out this uh, LW secret r sub f uh, contained in the ciphertext c sub f. And if I give you this secret r sub f, I'll think of it as an opening, you can break open the ciphertext c sub f and recover the output f of x you can subtract out a times r sub f, you get f of x plus some small error, f of x times q over two plus some small error, and you can correct for the error. So in particular, that means I can give you a small opening r sub f to a big function out output f of x, and that should really look a lot like functional encodings. So is this a good functional encoding scheme? Well, in terms of the opening sizes, uh, in, in terms of the sizes, uh, yes, it, it, it has the right uh, sizes. So I can give you a small opening of size n log q to a big output of size m, where m can be arbitrarily larger than n log q. So I've, I can have a much smaller opening than the output size, which is what we wanted. But what about security? So uh, let's start with the good news. The ciphertext C hides the input X under LWE. So we have some security property, but that's not what we wanted for functional encodings. For function encodings, we wanted more. We wanted to say that even if I evaluate some functions F and open up the result, resulting uh, ciphertext C sub F by giving you R sub F, then that doesn't reveal anything else other than the function output F of X. And unfortunately, that's not true for this scheme. If I give you R sub F, it might reveal additional information about X beyond the output F of X. So we're gonna try to fix this. And uh, as a warm up, let's see how to fix this in the case where I'm only ever going to give you one opening. Remember for functional encodings, I need to have security even if I give you many openings, Q openings, where Q can be very large. But let's start with just one opening security. So to get that, we can just augment our construction before and add a random LW sample to the encoding. And then when we evaluate the ciphertext C sub F, we can just add in this extra LW sample. And what that does is it just re-randomizes the evaluated ciphertext. And now we can give you the opening RF plus S where we add in the secret S from this LW sample 
And what that, what that ensures is that because we're adding in a random S, we essentially are re-randomizing the opening and ensuring that the new opening does not reveal anything about X beyond the output F of X. It's relatively easy to show that this construction is secure if we only give out one opening. It's simulation secure, and the simulator can essentially program this LW sample to program in any output it wants. So how do we do take this and generalize it beyond one opening security? How do we generalize it to a security with Q openings? So the first idea might be, let's add Q different LW samples to the ciphertext instead of just one LW sample B to get Q opening security. So that would work, but unfortunately that would mean the ciphertext size grows with Q and that's not what we wanted. We wanted to have uh, encodings that are smaller, that are much smaller, that, that are whose size is independent of Q. Another option would be to add these bunch of LW samples, not to the encoding, but to the CRS. So, so far we haven't used the CRS. Let's put the LW samples in there. But unfortunately that doesn't work either because when we give out the opening, we need to know the LW secrets S contained in these samples. And if they're just in a, some common reference string, uh, nobody knows the secret, including the honest algorithms that need to provide the openings. So instead, we're going to solve this by introducing a new primitive called oblivious LW sampling. This is a primitive that essentially lets you obliviously create LW samples without knowing a secret in a way where even if I do open them up, even if I do give you the secrets, these samples look like random LW samples. In more detail, we're going to consider a setting where there's a long CRS, but the CRS should be completely independent of the matrix A. So in particular, it cannot just like contain LW samples itself. In addition, there's going to be a short value P that does depend on A, but is short. Its size should be independent of the number of openings Q that I'm going to give out. And together, this long CRS and the short uh, value P will determine uh, capital Q different LW samples, uh, BI equals ASI plus EI. And uh, the security says that these samples uh, essentially look uniform. They look like random LW samples, even if I give you the openings to them. Unfortunately, I don't have time to give you the full definition, but it's a simulation-based definition of security. So now I'm going to show you how to construct oblivious LW samplings. And actually, we're going to do this by relying on the same dual GSW encryption scheme, FHE, that we use to construct functional encoding, we're also going to use that same scheme to construct oblivious LW sampling itself by combining it with a pseudorandom function. Let me start with a simplified construction. This construction doesn't have any kind of a CRS and it doesn't achieve our simulation-based definition, uh, but it's, uh, we're gonna see how to augment it to do so. And the idea is, let me set this short value P to be an GSW encryption, this dual GSW encryption of a random PRF key K. Now to generate the ith LW sample, we're going to homomorphically evaluate the following function GI of K. This function essentially generates a pseudorandom LW sample AS plus E, where S and E are sampled using the PRF with index I for the ith sample. Okay, so we're just uh, uh, generating a pseudorandom LW sample homomorphically. Uh, so to produce the I sample, we're going to homomorphically value this function. And the result, the output of that homomorphic evaluation is some value that looks like this, A times RG plus EG. So this is the randomness that comes from the homomorphic evaluation, plus the output of the function GI of K. But the output of the function GIFK is itself an LW sample AS plus E. So in full, we get this LW sample uh, shown over here on the bottom. It's the sum of two LW samples. The blue one comes from the homomorphic evaluation and the red one comes from the output of the PRF. So unfortunately, this notion does not have a CRS. There's no, uh, we, there's no simulator for it and it does not satisfy our definition of oblivious LW sampling. But actually, it may be good enough when used in the full construction of functional encodings. As far as we know, we don't have any attack on it. 
But uh, that's not what we want. We want to actually meet the definition we set out. And uh, to do that, we're going to augment the construction from the previous slide with the stuff in purple here. So we're going to add a CRS, which consists of just a bunch of random vectors bi hat. And we're going to augment this uh, short value p to be an encryption, not just of a PRFTK, but also of a flag bit beta. And beta is, is going to just be set to 0. Uh, when we do the homomorphic evaluation to produce the I, to produce the I sample, we're going to evaluate this function GIFK, which is the same as before. It, it computes a pseudo NMLW sample AS plus E. But in addition, we're going to add in the bit beta, the flag bit beta, times the I uh, value in the CRS, times BI hat. Now, remember that beta is set to zero in real life. And so in real life, this purple thing is just zero. And so we get the same kind of LW sample we got on the previous thing. But now we have an opportunity for a simulator to program the CRS to get to, to, to cause the, the uh, obliviously generated LW samples uh, uh, to be once it likes. And it does so by putting, by changing the CRS not to be uniformly random, but to consist of LW samples bi hat. And then it sets the flag bit beta to one. That way, the LW sample from the CRS is incorporated into the obliviously generated LW sample that's produced by this process. So uh, to prove the security of this construction, we need to rely on this new assumption. And here it is. This is the entire assumption on this slide. So the assumption is an indistinguishable base assumption. It says you cannot generate, uh, you cannot distinguish between the cases where the flag bit beta is zero and beta is one, given the following values. So let me read out what these values are. You're first given the LW matrix A. You're given the bunch of LW samples BI hat from the CRS. You're given this GSW encryption of the PRFKK and the bit beta, which is either zero or one. And uh, using these values already, and you can uh, evaluate the oblivious LWE sampling procedure to create LWE samples that look like this value on the bottom. It's a sum of three LWE samples, a blue one, which comes from the homomorphic evaluation, a red one, which comes from the output of the PRF, and a purple one, which comes from the CRS. Okay, so actually the purple one is incorporated when beta is one, but not when beta is zero. And uh, as the last part of the distribution, I'm actually going to open up this LW sample that you generated for you. And the assumption says that you still cannot tell whether beta is zero and one, even if I generate these LW samples and open them up and give you the underlying LW secret SI. So uh, I want to claim that this assumption has a circular security flavor. And the reason is the following. So we need to rely on the encryption here being secured to hide the bit beta. But when we open up the LW sample SI, we give you some, uh, this includes some value R sub GI, which depends on the homomorphic evaluation and depends on the encryption randomness. But we want to rely on the fact that we're adding in this pseudorandom sample S sub I star to argue that we're really blinding uh, this, uh, this value R sub GI, which might reveal something about the encryption randomness. So we're relying on the PRF output to hide information about the encryption randomness. On the other hand, the encryption uh, encrypts the PRF key, so we need to rely on the security of the encryption and on the secure of the encryption randomness to protect the PRF key itself. And you see that this, is, this requires some circularity in this assumption. So uh, that's all I wanted to say about the assumption and the construction. I want to just briefly mention some concurrent and follow-up works. Uh, in particular, there are two works that were concurrent to ours, and uh, a work by Gay and Pass and a work by Brakersky et al. Uh, they offer similar results in the sense that they construct an indistinguishable obfuscation from LWE style assumption, but then plausibly post quantum secure. They require new types of assumptions. And also, these new assumptions have some circular security flavor. 
But the exact abstractions and assumptions are different in these works. And so it's worth uh, looking at all of them. I also wanted to mention a work from the past crypto uh, by Hopkins, Jane, and Lynn. And uh, they actually show that all of the assumptions in all three of these works, our work and the other two, can be broken in their full generality. So for example, for our work, that means it can be broken if we instantiate them using a contrived PRF or more concrete like contrived uh, implementation of the circuit that does the PRF evaluation. And I think the takeaway from this work is that these schemes are still plausibly secure. They don't really invalidate the whole approach, uh, but we need to be more careful in how we instantiate it. And last, I wanted to mention a work uh, uh, that's going to appear uh, at uh, the upcoming TCC, uh, in which we give a concrete implementation uh, instantiation of the approach from the stock. Uh, and we uh, so we give a concrete PRF and concrete uh, algorithms for evaluating it. And it leads to a simplified assumption that's really amenable to crypto analysis. And we do some analysis of this assumption uh, uh, showing that some simple attacks fail. Uh, so that's all I want to say. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>